start with the agenda. Um, we'll check back in on the agenda a few times over the course of the project. And, um, or over the course of the presentation, we'll check back in on the agenda and see what we can determine and stay on track. We'll also pause at those points for questions. So um, as I said, everyone is muted now, but we'll unmute and uh, see where we can go from there. We'll unmute, take questions either in the chat or in voice. Okay. Um, on our call, we do have several CCS staff as well, so they will be available to help answer questions when we get to that portion as well. So we're gonna start with the project overview, and we'll go over the timeline of the project as a whole, and the structure for making decisions sort of generally, and then we'll talk more specifically about system configuration as well as training and testing, and we'll look ahead to the next several months and take time uh, at the end for any general questions that we didn't address during the whole presentation. So starting with the project overview, we have our project timeline here. And as you can see, the project is divided into four major phases. The project planning phase took place from May through June, and we're currently in our system configuration phase, which is that green chunk that you see on the center of your screen. Uh, there are several components of that, uh, mostly profiling and mapping, which we're gonna talk about separately. And then we'll move on to training, testing, and additional configuration. As you can see, that's the yellow portion here, and that's the largest, longest portion of our project. We'll preview some of the work that's gonna happen during this period, as well as responsibilities on CCS and the libraries, and then we'll focus in on some more detail at our next webinar. Our last section of the process is um, Go Live and Go Live Prep, which is purple here, and then, of course, the project will extend beyond Go Live for additional training um, in the future. So as I said at the beginning, we will have, um, this is the first of four webinars. Today we're reviewing the project as a whole, the system configuration and training and testing. In November, we'll look more closely at data testing, third-party configuration, and check in on how the training process is going and see um, where we can go from there. If we need to make any changes to the CCS training schedule, we'll have some flexibility um, in September through November, so we can perhaps make announcements there as needed. In February, we'll be about one month before Go Live, so we'll go over what we're calling our final checklist. We'll review the offline transaction, offline circulation that everyone will have seen in training, um, and just make sure everyone's feeling really confident and ready for the big day. And then after we go live, we will have um, a post-Go Live recap, and that will be about one month after Go Live. We'll schedule that meeting in November um, and get that date published. We'll look at any outstanding issues or um, outstanding issues or features that we maybe didn't implement initially that we may want to follow up on later and make sure everything is working as expected. And we'll look ahead to see what sort of additional documentation or training we're planning to provide. Uh, we are getting some chats. Um, and Deborah is working on audio issues with folks, so if I'm occasionally distracted, it's because I can't stop myself from looking at the chat. Um, all of our four meetings will begin at 1.30 p.m. and take place on WebEx, so by the end of the project, we'll be WebEx experts and uh, have all of our audio bugs worked out. And if, you're ha if you know, your colleagues are having audio issues or are not able to be here today, this meeting will be recorded and shared as well, as well the rest of the series. I wanna move on to the general project structure. This is sort of a high level overview and then individual pieces of the project will work a little bit differently, but we have four main groups involved in this project. We have governing board, the CCS implementation team, library staff advisory groups, and in library migration teams. And we'll hit, uh, take a look at each of these groups separately. 
So governing board provides oversight of the project and gives broad direction. We'll look in a little bit at the four guidelines that governing board set for us back in May that have been guiding the work we've been doing so far. Those guidelines are designed to help empower the CCS implementation team and the library staff advisory groups to make decisions in line with the goal of the project without having to pause and wait for governing board for approvals to all of the decisions we have to make. That said, we do know that there are some decisions that will need governing board discussion and approval, and we, those are related more to policy changes or requirements across all libraries. So we do have a list of those that we'll discuss briefly in a little bit that we'll be addressing at our upcoming July governing board meeting. So once governing board has given us the general guidelines, the CCS implementation team would be working most closely with Polaris and as well as our in-library teams and advisory groups to do the work of the project. So all CCS staff are heavily involved in the migration. Um, we have Deborah Wishmeyer, who is our project manager and key communicator. So I know you've all been talking a lot with her. And her Polaris um, counterpart is Mary Wood, our implementation manager. We're actually in the middle of a pretty sweet two-for-one deal. Uh, Chris Chelberg, also from Polaris, is uh, shadowing Mary and kind of training with her. So he's been participating in our calls and visits as well. Um, if ever you're confused or not sure where to send a question or who's responsible, um, one, always you can send it to the ticket system. But if you want to call someone on the phone, uh, Deborah, I'm going to go ahead and offer you up to everybody. Uh, Deborah can help redirect questions to the most appropriate staff member. So if you're not sure if a question is a systems question for Marcin or a data question for Bob, um, Deborah can help route those. Or again, if they're in the ticket system, we all can see them. Uh, Virginia and Mieko and member services are going to be working really hard with everyone on training and consulting, and we do have a vacant position in that department as well that we're currently recruiting for. So we'll have three training and consulting positions um, during the rest of the project. And then, as you can see here, we have some uh, specialists that will be dedicated to our project for different periods, including Michael O'Connor and Jerry Wadi from Polaris that will be partnering with us. Our library staff advisory groups are another key element of this project. While CCS staff have a lot of expertise about our current configuration and kind of generally how these systems work, we wanted to make sure that we had library input at every step of the way when we were setting up configuration um, and working through other tasks in the project. Um, instead of relying on our existing technical groups, which can be hard to schedule um, and are not a always the best forum for discussion given the volume, just the sheer number of people that will be there. Um, we have created these five tighter groups that have been providing consulting and expertise to us. So we have our technical services group, which is covering um, cataloging as well as serials and acquisitions. Our reports group, which is focusing on kind of high level administrative comparative reports across libraries. Our circulation group, which includes interlibrary loan and intra CCS loan our public services group, and then IT and system administration. And again, these groups have already been a key part of our profiling phase, and we'll continue to reach out to them for their knowledge and expertise as the project continues. Um, while the library advisory groups are representative of our libraries when we look at kind of size and diversity of um, processes and procedures, we do need to work with individual libraries. And we've asked each library to set up an in-library migration team to be that core group of library staff that partners with CCS on project work. The specific size and makeup varies by library uh, depending on the library's individual needs. We did issue a recommendation saying that we'd like to know who's responsible for um, these five areas of responsibility that we'll be talking about when we get into our um, training, testing, and configuration phase. Uh, but if a library wants to have a 12-person migration team or a one-person migration team, that's fine. What we need to know at CCS is who we communicate with when we're checking in on deadlines, who's authorized to submit things like the profiling surveys, like if we got two um, from a library, which has not happened, everyone's been doing great. Um, who, who actually has the authority from the library to submit that information. And then when it comes to library responsibilities later in the project, the in-library migration team is going to oversee 
that work that happens, whether they do the work kind of centrally as a group or they delegate tasks and ensure that they're completed. Um, this group is who will be reporting into CCS that that work has been completed. So that was like a very high level overview of what, um, who's making decisions and kind of what our giant phases of the project are. Um, I'd like to pause now to take questions and then we can move on to system configuration after that. So I'm going to briefly stop sharing. Um, I cannot unmute everybody unless I stop sharing my screen. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody's phone. So now anything you say, everyone can hear. Um, and just take a minute if there are questions about anything I covered so far. Um, so you can use the chat or you can um, just speak up and share in the, in the group. Okay. Um, I am going to continue on then. Thank you. So our next, oh, I should have muted everyone first. All right. So our next step is going to be um, reviewing system configuration, which includes profiling and mapping. So here is our whole project schedule again, and I've highlighted the system configuration phase of the project, which is where we are now. Specifically, profiling is uh, glowing here in as that first bar, um, and that's a, a multi-month project. Profiling is the configuration of system settings, including library names and hours, material type and patron code lists, which fields are indexed, settings in the OPAC, and lots of other settings that on a day-to-day -day basis we don't necessarily think about. Um, settings, depending on which one, can apply to the whole system, all of CCS, at the library level, which is what we're calling the institution or the agency, and then a branch, which is the specific building or pickup point. So in Polaris documentation and in CCS documentation, you may see references to branch library, like to a branch, um, and that just means your general building. Um, each library, even those that only have one building, have both a library and a branch in the Polaris system. Kind of looking at a blow up of the project schedule here, looking at profiling, we can see what's happening over the two months that we're really dedicating to profiling, which is June and July. So initially, we started the. Oops, we started with a Polaris on-site visit from June 12th to 14th, and at that meeting we had not only CCS staff but one representative from each advisory group, which we're calling our profiling team. And during that meeting, we reviewed um, all of the different settings we need to make decisions about in order to get Polaris set up and configured. We had library staff at those meetings so they could help us. Um, ask the right questions, and also communicate what we had learned to our advisory groups. So looking at June 19th through July 5th, we had library advisory groups, again, those five that we talked about a couple minutes ago, um, each come into the CCS office where we reviewed the relevant portions of the profiling document with each advisory group. Um, some of the things that we discussed, we were able to see a clear consensus in the group and say, okay, this is how we move forward. Other elements, we said, you know what, this may need governing board approval, this would be a really big change. And other things we said, you know, we need um, individual libraries to weigh in on this or to have the opportunity to customize based on their specific needs. And that's where our next phase comes in, which is weekly profiles distributed to libraries. So over the past several weeks, we've been sending surveys out. Um, kind of one per week since the end of June, and we've got one more coming this week, and I'll talk in more detail about those. About midway through the process, Polaris came back out. Um, July 6th and 7th, our profiling team met with us in Polaris again, and we were able to review all of the questions that came up in the discussions with the advisory groups and the research and analysis that CCS was doing centrally. 
We're also now in the midst of meeting again with all of our advisory groups. We've collected a lot of data from libraries, we've learned a lot more about the system, and we may need to revise some of our initial decisions or recommendations. So we have another set of meetings with those advisory groups. And then everything is due on the 28th because we need to turn it around to Polaris. And we'll look at that um, on the next couple of slides. So the process as a whole, um, we've had a lot of people ask what's happening centrally, what's happening at the in individual library, um, why at my library can I not decide some of these things that I would like to have control over? Um, and there's a lot of different answers and a different path that we could take, but the general process is that CCS staff is gathering and synthesizing information from several sources in order to kind of distill everything into um, either completed profiles where we have that knowledge and everything we need to move forward, or into those surveys where we do need to say, this is something that libraries need to have control over or need input in. And um, we'll talk about those specifically moving forward. But what are we looking at? First and foremost, we have the governing board guidelines, which I've already mentioned. Um, we've been, we have the expertise of the Polaris staff and our advisory groups. We've been talking with other consortia about their settings, what they did during their profiling, what they maybe wish they'd done differently, or what they thought they were, what they changed like six months or a year after going live on Polaris. Um, we've been working with that profiling team, that subset of our advisory groups, and we've also been analyzing current configuration, um, which is not to say we're taking what we have and just dumping it in the new system, but um, looking at this current system settings and seeing what's been working well and what's not, and then uh, again, either filling out that profile, <coughs> excuse me, or reaching out to libraries to get more information on the profiling survey. I've mentioned the governing board guidelines a few times. Um, we shared them in our newsletter and they're posted on their migration portal, but I want to repeat them here um, and kind of explain how they're used. So they are listed here in priority order. Um, according to our mission and vision and our strategic plan, our number one goal is to deliver a great experience for patrons. So when we're choosing between option A and option B, our recommendation is going to be whichever one delivers the most value to patrons. Sometimes that's not, you know, option A and option B don't have an impact on patrons or, um, you know, it's very minimal. So then we'd look at our next three guidelines. Wherever possible, we want to move towards standardization. And that means, um, first, using the system as it was designed to do um, and using the procedures and processes that were built to go along with the system. And also that where we can be more consistent across libraries to deliver value to patrons, we do so. And that consistency across libraries feeds into our third goal and our third guideline, which is to enable consistent reporting. One of the struggles we've heard about from uh, libraries over the past couple of years is they want to, you know, they maybe get really detailed reports for their selectors, but they struggle to kind of make high level decisions based on real life actual data and it's more anecdotal. Or they, you know, they feel like their library is doing really well, but how do they compare to their peers in the community? So we wanted to enable consistent reporting at that administrative level while still retaining the day-to-day -day needs of selectors, technical services staff, and people who are in the system and need to get data out to do their everyday jobs. And then finally, um, we want to save library staff time. Uh, if, if something is going to really be better for the patrons overall and maybe take a little bit more work on the part of staff, we want to preference the patron and, and do, deliver that optimal patron experience. But if all other things being equal, we have one option that is manual and maybe going to take a lot of time and another option that can be automated without losing um, anything in the patron experience, let's save library staff time and free them up to deliver more direct services to patrons instead of focusing on manual processes. So those four guidelines were um, shared with all of our advisory groups and our profiling team and we're always at are at the forefront of our minds when we're looking at decision making. 
Uh, those guidelines are not um, intended to get down to the, the detail level, and we do think that there are some things that need governing board decisions. So um, CCS staff have put together a list of recommendations for governing board to be discussed and voted on at the July 26th meeting. We have a document available on our website that was um, published in last week's newsletter and also emailed directly to our governing board members as well as library leads. And it outlines what the CCS recommendations are. Um, and we did our best to kind of put it in context. How does this compare to how Symphony works? Why would we want to do something different in Polaris? Or if we're recommending doing the same thing, um, why are we doing that? So these are things, again, related to standardization across libraries, maybe some required data entry fields. Um, and we're continuing to kind of monitor the, the responses we're getting in from libraries. And if we need to provide an update in the governing board packet or at the meeting on some of these, we will do that as well. But our intention in getting them out last week was that um, directors would be able to discuss this with staff as appropriate. Um, you know, maybe you wanted to check in with your circulation manager and you had the time to do that um, so that everyone's prepared for that July 26th meeting to make a decision because we'll need that information um, no later than July 28th. So here we are back at our schedule. Um, and I've called out specifically that we had several surveys that we sent out over that period. Um, each survey had a, went out at least one week before its due date, and there were a few that had um, two or more weeks. We need all of those library responses back by the 28th, and we need those decisions from Governing Board on the 26th in order to prepare for this August final profile review. So um, on that August 1st date, we need to have sent all of the profiles for all libraries, for all settings to Polaris. Um, Polaris will use the profiles to create the database and prepare for data mapping. So until we have those profiles loaded in our database, we have no system. So the timeline and the deadlines on this, on this work are um, key to keeping our project on track. So what is data mapping anyway, and how, well, how is it different from profiling? We're back at our schedule. Um, so you can see uh, I've highlighted here the data mapping portion of our system config section. And uh, if you just compare profiling to mapping, you'll see a not insignificant discrepancy in the amount of time we have to dedicate to this task. So uh, we will be looking at much tighter turnarounds on data mapping than we were looking at on data profiling. Data mapping is determining how our existing data fits in the new system. So in profiling, we determined what material types were going to exist in Polaris. And then in mapping, we look at how we're going to populate the actual data. So which symphony item types correspond with which Polaris material type. Or in Symphony, we have patron categories, and in Polaris, we have something called a user-defined field or a UDF. So how do we um, align these pieces of data? And what I have on the screen here is a very simplistic example of um, potential item type mapping. We have a lot of very specific item types in Symphony because of the way the system functions. And if I want to do anything special with a Blu-ray, I need a special Blu-ray item type for it. Whereas in Polaris, I can have you know, one Blu-ray material type, and then if I have Blu-ray that I need to treat specially, maybe no holds or maybe a different kind of loan period, I can control that at the item level, and I therefore only need, uh, or I need fewer Blu-ray material types than Symphony item types. Again, that's a very simple example. What's, what's more realistic is um, the example on, on this slide. So mapping also involves incorporating changes to our existing data to fit it into the new system. So several libraries now collect gender information in our patron category one. Uh, and there is no patron category one in Polaris. We have our patron stat class. Um, but there is a gender field. So we can populate that gender field based on the gender information in patron cat one for those libraries that collect it. Another question that's come up several times is, how do I handle my special loan periods 
you're telling me I only have one Blu-ray material type, how is Polaris going to know which Blu-rays go out for seven days and which go out for 14, which can have holds and which cannot? So my previous example where my map just had two columns, um, here I now have five columns. So I need to look at the item library and the symphony item type, and then using that information um, as well as data from the circulation map, I can tell our Polaris data loader that anything that is a Blu-ray recent in Symphony should be a regular old Blu-ray material type in Polaris, but it should go out only for seven days and not have holds, whereas something with a Blu-ray long should go out for 14 days and any patron can place a hold on it. So the mapping is, um, again, will range in complexity from simple to complicated based on how how much variation there is in our system. So how is this going to work? CCS will handle the mapping centrally based on our current configuration, feedback and notes made during profiling, and then where that's not enough or maybe there's some conflict in what your current configuration says and your policy on your website and the, the questions or notes that you made during profiling, we'll reach out to libraries on an individual basis to get um, follow-up. So, um, with profiling, you had the opportunity to review profiles on that week-to-week -week basis in those profiling surveys. But with mapping, um, the library review of data mapping will largely happen during the testing and training phase. So um, we'll be, again, turning over our profiles to Polaris. They'll be loading them. We'll be mapping the data. And then they'll be loading the data in order to prepare for training, testing, and configuration, which is what we're going to talk about next. So again, I'm going to stop sharing briefly. Quickly unmute everyone. And if anyone has any questions, you can pop them in the chat or share them with the group. I just want to give a couple seconds in case anyone's furiously typing and I can't see it. Hi, Rebecca. Can you hear me? I can. I can hear you very quietly. Fine. Okay. This is Becky at Fremont. Um, I was just wondering about um, having filled out the surveys and we have spots where we can comment where we might have uh, questions about, like, you know, we, we're putting it in as, as well as we think. If we mm -hmm. put questions in there, are they going to come back again for people to reassess if for some reason multiple people have that same question or how is that going to work? Yeah, so um, Becky's question, if I understand it correctly, and feel free to jump in, Becky, if I'm not um, grasping it, uh, uh, is in short, what are we doing with the feedback we're getting? If we get a lot of the same question from libraries, are we looking at if we need to make a change in our proposed model? Or will libraries have the opportunity to make changes later uh, based on getting additional information? So maybe kind of a two-parter? Yes. Okay. So um, the answer to the first part is yes. Um, as we're getting those surveys back in, um, we are saying, and there's a question in the chat that says, will we have uh, new material types? It, in reviewing our survey responses, we're considering if we missed anything and if you know we need to maybe add a different kind of material type to accomplish some work that we had hoped to do a different way um, or plan to do a different way. So we are looking at that information and will potentially make changes before turning content over and we'll um, include those changes for libraries whether or not they maybe ask the question. So. Um, one example that's come up that we're researching internally is libraries that have separate limits for the number of adult DVDs that can check out versus youth DVDs. So if we can only accomplish that by adding um, an additional material type and several libraries want to maintain those limits, then we'd look at adding another material type. Um, and then for libraries who want to make changes, We'll talk about we'll the talk about training the and testing period and how we can 
accommodate some changes during that period, not to kind of system-wide uh, configuration as much as uh, mapping and kind of local library use. Um, so I have another question in the chat. Um, it says, if we have concerns about some of the items in the governing board packet, do we just start discussing them now or wait for the board meeting? Um, you should be discussing those internally at your library. So um, we don't, I want to make sure that we cover the rest of the content in our, on our agenda today. So we're not really going to discuss those elements here, but in your library you should be sharing your thoughts on um, kind of reasoning with your library director so they're prepared for the governing board meeting. Again, with that short turnaround, uh, we, we will need to be making decisions on those elements at the meeting so we can finish configuring the system in accordance with those governing board um, decisions. Um, what will the upcoming profiling documents be asking for? Can you give us a broad overview? Um, Deborah, are you on the line? Can you kind of preview what we're expecting this week? Yeah, sure. Um, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so we have one more profiling survey that will go out um, this Friday. Um, and in this particular survey, we'll be focusing on um, essentially loan, loan period codes for items. Um, we, we discussed this already at the circulation advisory group this afternoon, and I got some good feedback from them. Um, so it will be essentially how we want to set up our new loan period codes. Um, to like, be the most efficient and allow patrons to check out um, items based on the, the loan limits at, at their current library. Um, we'll also, in this week's profiling document, be talking about limits, hold limits, like how many um, holds that patrons can place on a certain material type. Thanks, Deborah. Um, You're welcome. Um, we, we are getting a lot of echoing. I apologize for that. Um, so we have a question of if there is a preview of surveys for. Um, in general, we haven't been able to send previews out ahead of time because we're still gathering information um, kind of up until the day before they're released. Uh, but this one, based on what Deborah has previewed and what we've seen before, should be a little bit shorter than some of the others. Um, so hopefully it'll be pretty simple to fill out. There was a question in the chat, I think it was maybe sent privately, just noting some vacation and migration team availability in a library. But if you have um, specific concerns, go ahead and contact uh, Deborah offline as well. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody again, and we'll have questions again at the end. Okay, so we are on to training and testing, where we'll cover CCS and library responsibilities and some information on how to report issues. So CCS and libraries will each have responsibilities in five major areas, and these will probably look familiar to you if you are if you were reading our documentation and recommendations for the in-library migration team. So one of the primary responsibilities that we have um, shared during this time is training. We have to get, make sure all library staff are prepared to use the new system when we go live in April. We also need to dedicate time to data testing to make sure the system works as we expect it to and our data is where we want it to be. We'll need to configure our, and test our third-party products and peripherals, configure and test PowerPack, and communicate with patrons about the changes they can expect in April. So I'm going to start with training and go through each of these five areas and talk about what CCS is going to be doing centrally and what libraries will want to plan for at their local level. The first is training. Um, and between the Polaris training and the CCS training we currently have scheduled, um, we're each offering about 360 seats 
um, total for all of the different kinds of trainings um, that need to happen from circulation managers to IT staff to serials. So in total, there's about 720 seats or about 30 seats per library in those centrally led training sessions. Um, but most of our libraries have more than 30 people that need to understand how to use Polaris. So there's this gap in what we're training on and or how many people we're able to train and how many people need training. So there's two ways that we expect libraries to fill this gap. One is with library-led group training and the second is with individual learning. So the, the larger portion of that would be library-led group training um, for which CCS will provide checklists, documentation, some, maybe some videos that can be used in a group session, but this will have to be determined and coordinated at the library level. And then individuals should also be, um, whenever possible, planning some time to kind of reinforce the training that they have. Our training period is from um, September through April, so if you get the bulk of your training maybe in November, you need to be using the system and kind of practicing in order to stay prepared and stay confident for go live in April. So training isn't really a one and done. I've attended my session, now I'm finished. There's this level of individual responsibility that we'll be looking for as well. In terms of training, um, and some of this has already happened or will continue to happen, CCS will schedule um, all of the CCS and Polaris-led training sessions, host them in our facility, and schedule the workflow consultations, which will be held individually at each library. So the scheduling for those pieces has um, largely concluded, although we may add sessions to CCS training as needed. We'll also provide training checklists for use with in-library training. So if you want to, um, you're working on a training for your circulation staff, we'll have some checklists of um, tasks that all CERC staff members should be able to do um, and other resources you can use um, like handouts and procedural documentation. Uh, we'll also try to create some short videos for very common tasks that individuals can watch kind of at their leisure. Um, and that will all be shared and distributed on our migration portal and we'll send regular updates in the migration update. Library staff will be responsible for making sure the right people are registered for centrally led training by the applicable deadlines. So we um, have this listed as a library responsibility because we have um, that limit on the number of people who can register for each type of training. So we wanna make sure, and everyone has been doing great at this, I think we're almost finished with registration. Um, we wanna make sure that the right people are registered for each session and that those people who are trained um, are going to be the library experts to work with the in-library migration team on in-library training. So each library needs to determine the amount, format, and schedule of in-library training, which is going to vary greatly from library to library. We have lots of different departmental structures, staffing profiles, and sheer numbers of employees that need training. Um, we can we can produce CCS provided training resources to deliver the training. So again, we can have agendas, we can have handouts, we can kind of help you build the content for your training, but um, ensuring that all staff are adequately trained will be the responsibility of the library. Where you need additional resources, um, please request assistance from us. Um, you know, we've, we're working to provide what we think will be most useful, but you know, I'm sure we'll miss something and where we do, we need to hear from libraries about what would be helpful. The next area of responsibility would be data testing. Um, and there's two main, there's kind of two broad components to data testing. One is the data comparison. Does the data in Polaris line up with the corresponding data in Symphony? Um, this will help, uh, CCS will help you make these determinations by copying the, our Symphony production server, so the, the server we use every day, to our test server at the same time the data is extracted. That means, um, you know, our production database gets updated every minute, right? Every time an item is checked out or returned or a patron is added, that data is getting further and further away 
from the data we're going to send to Polaris at the end of this month. By making a copy of production to test, um, the test server will be available for all libraries to use, and that will stay more or less static except for maybe new patrons created as part of training um, and other sort of hands-on exploration. But it will be a much more uh, representative sample when we're looking at is the Polaris data in the right spot. Aside from whether or not the data is in the right place, uh, we need to know if the system works the way we think it should. So while you could begin your data comparison testing as soon as we provide you access to the system, um, your configuration testing, does the system work the way I think it should, um, won't be very effective until after you've participated in training. So depending on when you're registered for training either with um, Polaris or CCS or in your own library, um, that's when you'd start sort of your hands-on configuration testing. CCS will um, perform quality assurance on all data types, spot check data for all libraries, coordinate issue logging and resolution with Polaris, and provide data testing instructions for library staff. And the reason that we have a couple of reasons that we um, are asking that library staff participate in training. The first is just a question of time management. CCS is a small organization, but we manage a very large database. And we, um, we just don't have the number of eyes and number of man hours needed to get our hands on a broad swath of records of each data type. So we're going to be in there. We're going to be testing. It's going to be um, one of our primary focuses over several months. But having library staff participate in that gives us allows us to cover more ground, so to speak, when looking at records. And also, um, library staff have, in many cases, more knowledge about what where data anomalies are maybe due to a local practice um, or why how data differs from library A to library B. And while we are trying to minimize some of those discrepancies, we know that um, they exist and library staff are the most expert in their own data. So library staff will at minimum need to complete the data testing exercises that we assign in that weekly newsletter. Um, and that can be a small number of people who participate in, you know, completing and informing us that those tasks have been finished. Um, they'll want to report issues to CCS and we'll talk about how to do that. But I would really encourage libraries to um, make time and space for all library staff to participate in testing. It will do um, two really important things. It will, one, reduce the number of potential problems we see at or after go live. So everything we see during data testing that is reported to us, we have the opportunity to fix before it impacts our actual day-to-day -day operations at go live. Um, the second thing that is really important, I referenced earlier when I talked about individual learning, is that it gives library staff the opportunity to explore using the new system. So um, if you're testing the functionality of you know, creating a user template or copying users, you're also practicing creating a user template and copying users. So when we're live and you know it's day two and it's your first time registering a patron in the new system, you know that you can do it because you've done it several times in data testing and training. So any time that we can dedicate to data testing is going to have a really significant impact on our success with the migration as a whole. <clears throat> that brings us to third party and peripheral, peripheral testing. We're grouping these two sort of different things together. Um, when, I, when we refer to third party products, we're largely talking about SIP connected tools, um, whether it's um, an automated materials handler or sorter, um, a self check, a tool like lynda.com or Canopy, anything that kind of queries the database to get information in order to do its job outside of the system. A peripheral, when we talk about it in this um, project, we're really talking about things that just plug in to your computer, like your RFID pad or barcode scanners. Um, so during this um, September to March period, we will want to configure and test as many of those as possible. And that 
A lot of that will happen centrally. Um, we'll be looking at our existing SIP configuration in order to get everything set up in Polaris. But um, you know, when it comes to actually testing those connections, we'll need to work with library staff. And we may need library staff to coordinate with third-party vendors, although we will try to do as much of that centrally as possible. Um, some vendors may not have that mechanism to work with the consortium rather than an individual library. CCS will provide templates for um, printing options, uh, although those may need to be kind of replicated at the individual level or set up or customized at the library level. And we will coordinate issue logging and resolution with Polaris. So again, library staff um, will really need some good communication on this as we uh, communicate with both the third party vendor as well as Polaris on the individual library tools. This is an area where each library has a very different set um, or combination of some very common pieces. And then some libraries have, are maybe the only library using a tool. So we wanna make sure we don't let anything fall through the cracks. So we'll be um, working mostly on third party and peripheral testing in October and later after CCS staff have had this admin training at the end of September. We'll also have power pack configuration and testing work to do. And this will be another area where we kind of split configuration um, based on both the system abilities and um, CCS and library staff knowledge and abilities. So uh, some system, some settings will happen at the system level in consultation with our PASS group. Some may happen at the library level. Um, CCS will work to coordinate integrations like Novelist and Syndetics, which are included um, kind of in central contracts. So we'll get those set up with Polaris. Other tools that are maybe specific to libraries, such as StackMap, um, we're happy to help consult and work with um, getting that initially set up, but we do need to get some solid communication from libraries about any additional needs. StackMap we're pretty solid on, given um, our level of involvement over the last year or so, but if there are other tools that libraries have that we maybe don't know about, we'll need those communicated before we can move forward with configuration. And again, this will be happening um, more towards the fall. And we do have some consulting hours available from Polaris to help us with customization and configuration of the pack. And uh, again, we'll have to do some testing, which may involve issue logging, which CCS will coordinate at the central level. And finally, we're at um, patron communication. So we need to make sure that our communities know that a change is coming for them. Uh, CCS has already um, issued a joint press release with Innovative. It's available on our website and was included in the executive committee packet and will go out to governing board as well. Um, CCS will continue to update the schedule and it will become more detailed um, regarding anticipated downtime after our test data load. So at our November meeting, um, our November webinar, we'll go over what that go live schedule will look like, um, which will give us the information we need to provide some customizable pieces for libraries to use in communicating with their patrons. Um, we can also provide some short instructional videos on how to use the library catalog if libraries would like to use those. Um, and our goal is just to Again, not each library needs to reinvent the wheel when it comes to communicating some basic information about the pack. Although libraries who may want to customize um, at your individual library, you know best how to communicate with your patrons and what's been effective in the past. Library staff should monitor the weekly migration update for any changes to the project schedule. Um, and then any printing that needs to happen, like maybe we, um, our, our group develops a postcard sized mailing. If your library would like to mail that to your patrons, um, it would be up to the library to print and distribute it. Okay, so we um, have said a lot of times, the library, one of the big library responsibilities is, report, is to report issues to CCS. We wanna make it as easy as possible for you to do that. Um, and as part of that goal and part of our strategic plan, we'll be implementing a new help desk um, and sharing a lot more information on that on July 28th. 
While Wonderdesk will remain active for open tickets, um, so it's not going away yet, um, all tickets created on, on or after August 7th will be created in the new ticket system. So Wonderdesk will remain active, but we'll turn off the ability to create a new, a new ticket and we'll be um, sharing the link to the new system both in our newsletter on the 28th, um, on our website, in Wonderdesk, everywhere we possibly can. More details and documentation will be coming in the July 28th update. And one of the things we're really looking forward to is the ability to both open and update tickets either via email or an online portal. So right now, um, it's, it's very challenging to um, update tickets when you get a response via email. You have to log into the system to update them. We just want to make the system more streamlined for libraries, especially as we anticipate an uptick in the number of issues that are coming in since we'll have so many um, questions and comments about data testing over the next several months. What kinds of issues might you report? Um, unexpected data mismatches between Symphony and Polaris, functionality issues and questions, configuration issues and questions, and also procedure or best practice questions. All of that can go into the ticket system, and the benefit of sending it to the system rather than to an individual staff member is that we can better track what kinds of questions we're getting and from how many different libraries, because maybe there's an indication of a communication issue on our end. Um, if maybe um, Deborah answers a question that came in on Monday and a similar question comes in on Wednesday, um, even if another staff member handles it, we can more easily see the question and response for that original question and make sure we're sharing consistent information across libraries. So um, we'll also be redirecting, uh, you'll be able to just send a, a simple email to like needs or to help at ccslib.org. And just like I did, you may be conditioned to say, well, I think I'm supposed to just send stuff to needs at. So we'll be redirecting those emails to the, help, the new help desk system. A general best practice, and we'll talk about this a lot more as we approach the data testing um, period. Whenever you're reporting issues to CCS, if, if we're talking about specific records or groups of records, um, sending all or our sample record IDs, either a barcode or um, a control number, is really helpful for us when we're diagnosing the issue. If you're trying to, if you find yourself writing a paragraph to describe where on the screen something is located, you can um, easily attach a file and send a screenshot. And if you're talking about something that happened that you weren't expecting, if you can outline the steps you took before the unexpected thing happened, that will really help us replicate and diagnose the issue. Um, and we'll provide lots of instructions on how to do all of that, um, good reminders on best practices moving forward. And we had a question or a comment in the chat that it might be helpful to provide some basic documentation on um, grabbing screenshots and indicating the area of the screen that is a problem. So we can include that in our documentation as well. So um, that is a quick look at training and testing, which will be, again, the focus of our November meeting. Um, as well as several migration updates and the next round of, or the next round-ish of technical group meetings. So we'll expect a lot more information coming forward, but I wanted to make sure people had a general sense of what their responsibilities would be moving forward. Um, we had a lot of feedback on the last, um, on the last pause for questions. So I am not gonna unmute everyone. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I do have a couple of questions in the chat already. Um, we have a question, are we migrating tickets from Wonderdesk for historical record keeping? Um, we are not. We are, um, we're not planning on doing that um, largely because the user structure will be really different um, or significantly different, but we will have access to Wonderdust that lives on our server, so we can um, keep it for archive access. 
Uh, we do not have a, an official cutoff date on if or when we will take away the ability to log into Wonderdesk. So um, we can talk more internally and work with libraries who might be interested in getting uh, maybe copies of their own tickets or develop a system in-house for keeping them for data retention. Other questions? I have a hand raise from Nina. Nina, I'm going to unmute you. Did you have a question or is your hand, your metaphorical hand raised from something previous? It, it was raised from something previous. Okay, then I'm going to mute you again. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so you can use the hand raise feature in, um, in the webinar software if you do have a question or you can use the chat. Seeing no questions, I'm going to move ahead. So we're just going to preview what's coming um, over the next few months. We have August where we will complete our Polaris-led training registration. And again, it seems like most libraries have finalized those registrations. And we'll begin using the new help desk. In September, Polaris-led training will begin. Registration for CCS-led training will open and workflow consultations and data testing begin. So September is going to be a big month. It will most, um, all of these things will happen uh, mid-September or later, um, as outlined on the migration portal. October is going to be another busy month, although um, fewer meetings. Uh, a third-party configuration will begin, and we'll be coordinating with libraries um, more specifically about what what products we'll be co um, configuring centrally, what libraries may need to do um, at a local level. We'll can really ramp up, ramp up data testing as more library staff get training. And both of those two pieces will continue into November as well. And we'll have our next all staff webinar. At that webinar, um, we'll check in on how all of those processes are going and we'll have more information based on our, data, our test data load. Um, to give more details about the Go Live week, what that will look like, um, and the preparation for Go Live, um, and if any sort of major issues have come up um, that require any sort of large scale change. Hopefully not, and we're just dealing with tiny tweaks during data testing, but we've got that November meeting to discuss it. Um, we have another question. Uh, oh, more questions in the chat. I love it. Um, Migration News will detail specific tasks and deadlines, um, and we'll give more specific project updates as well. So um, one question in the chat, when can we learn more about reports that can be generated? We will have some training specific to reports. We'll be using a tool called Simply Reports, um, and we'll have a webinar on how to use that that will be recorded. So whether or not you can attend on that specific day, you'll have access to it. Um, CCS still has to learn more about the reports that can be generated as well, um, but all of that training and documentation will be generated starting in September. Um, we have another question that says, when will the staff client be ready for testing in-house? That's a great question. Um, the staff client will be ready when training begins. Um, we, if I can just pop back This will be faster. Pop back to our schedule. So um, here we have the test data load that's starting August 28th and running basically until Labor Day. Um, when that test data load is complete, CCS staff will um, have the opportunity, have about a week to review the database and make sure there's no um, big problems before training begins the following week. So we'll be coordinating with libraries on getting the client installed before that, but there won't be um, the opportunity to log in and do any work until after the data load is complete. So um, for in-house purposes, I would say um, like September 15th or well, 15th, yeah, that's a weekday. Um, I would say like September 15th-ish, um, the staff client will be ready for testing in-house. 
we probably will not have our first data testing assignment that first week, but later in September. Additional questions? Uh, that will include LEAP, yes. So that when I say the staff client, um, I'm referring both to the traditional client that we'll use for sort of technical services functions as well as the LEAP client. Uh, we have another question about e-commerce. Um, pro, will ProPay be coordinated through Polaris? Um, at, not at the July governing board, um, but the September governing board, we will be um, determining if, if we will be using one specific vendor for e-commerce, which has been the executive committee recommendation, and who that will be. So we'll have a, CCS will be developing a recommendation of the options that are available for integration with Polaris, which would the CCS recommendation for um, kind of a group use be. Uh, the two vendors that are currently integrated are um, Envisionware and, oh gosh, Comprise. <laughs> Envisionware and Comprise. Um, so we're reviewing the integration, the cost, the reporting features, the ease of use for patrons, um, and also uh, kind of the tightness of the integration because so far neither of them are integrated directly in LEAP, only in the traditional staff client and the online catalog. So we're, we're waiting for some updates from Polaris on who they'll be pursuing LEAP integration with first. So watch for that information or more details on that in September. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'll stay on the line for a couple of minutes if anything else comes up. Um, but I'd like to thank everyone for making time to participate today. Um, if you have additional questions, CCS staff are available by phone or um, email or ticket system. Please let us know how things are going at your library and if there's anything we can do to help clarify. Thanks, everyone.